We lead with this. No major safety concerns were initially identified by the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority with the Johnson & Johnson Sisonke trial. The authority has released a statement saying there is no relationship between the vaccine and the development of blood clots. That's, of course, with regards to the trial in South Africa. The rollout of the vaccine has been put on pause for now after the U.S. FDA and CDC raise concerns. Professor Helen Rees is the chairperson of the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority and joins me now live. Thanks for your time, Prof. So looking at the statement initially when you met with those involved in the Sisonke trial regarding the Johnson & Johnson vaccines, you didn't see any major concerns, but now you have red flags. Just take us through that process. So um, in terms of what South Africa has done, we were involved in the original trial, the ensemble study, which showed that this, the J&J vaccine looks to be an effective vaccine in the setting of our variant and was safe. Um, and uh, based on that, we are rolling it out to healthcare workers. And we've now reached uh, almost 300,000 healthcare workers. Um, it's a single dose vaccine. It's easy to store. Um, and that makes it programmatically easier to administer. Uh, but because it's uh, uh, in a clinical trial still, it's what we call a 3B clinical trial. What we're doing is uh, everybody receives the vaccine, there's no placebo, but we're monitoring safety very closely um, and um, any other, anything that, that would worry us as a side effect. So in our study, in the 3B study, we haven't seen this very rare condition, this, this form of thrombosis that has been identified in the United States. However, in the U.S., they've been rolling the vaccine out, which, of course, is now on a different scale. They've rolled it out to nearly 7 million people, and they've had six cases of a, a very unusual and rare thrombotic event uh, together with a change in the clotting factors in the blood. So there, there have been six cases of this in women uh, and in younger women under the age of about 55 or so. So this, is, uh, this was a, a signal to them that they should just investigate those cases. Now, when you roll out to nearly 7 million people, it's very different to rolling out to tens of thousands of people in early clinical trials and now in our 3B trial to, to 300 and hopefully 500,000 people. So you might well pick up very rare events uh, for two reasons. One is things happen when you do trials, in, when you roll out rather into millions of people, because, you know, health, health concerns, health conditions do develop. So you need to understand the difference between something that would have happened anyway, just because you're introducing a vaccine into huge numbers of people versus is this and could this be causally associated with the vaccine? So this is what the Food and Drug Administration of the U.S. is looking at. They're asking the question, do we think that this is just chance that we've seen these six cases in nearly seven million people? That's under one per million. Or do we think that there might be a causal effect, a link between the use of the vaccine and this, this rare condition? It's just that we haven't seen this locally, but just as a precaution, the, the study has been paused while this investigation is going on. But it, this, is, this is hopefully going to be done very rapidly. That's a concern, isn't it? The fact that, of course, we were inoculating 292,000 healthcare workers and we haven't seen such side effects. But when you do a mass scale vaccination process, you have these six people who have the blood clot. So what kind of protection do South Africans have, given that we are still in the early stages when it comes to the rollout of these vaccines? In fact, we're pretty far behind. Yeah, I, I think many people are sort of desperate to get the rollout going. Government, but, but the general population. Uh, I think the first thing to say is that clearly these checks and balances that we've put in place, and we've spoken about quite a lot, to monitor safety are working. We were able to say to the MRC, who's running the, the, the rollout study, can we look at all your safety data? They've been submitting it anyway to the regulatory authority. But we're able to look and say, have we seen anything that looks like this? And the answer at the moment is no. But we're also uh, assuming that we do then continue with the study, uh, be able to infer that in the event we see this rare event, that we'll pick it up. So that kind of thinking is already going on. Um, it, it also shows that globally, we are able to pick up these unusual events, rare events, 
and do what's necessary to say, is it associated with the vaccine, yes or no? And if it is, how big a risk is it? Um, and, and that's what uh, we've undertaken to do as a, a global community of, of regulatory authorities with the World Health Organization. So in that sense, this is, this is working well. But obviously, what we want to get to is the answer. It, could this be possibly linked? If it is linked, if we think it could possibly be linked, what is the risk of the vaccine versus the risk of having COVID? And what we do know about COVID infection is that one of the ways that it causes profound damage and severe disease and deaths is because it causes clots um, and it causes little emboli as well. So, and, and this is common. This is really common in that infection, particularly at the severe end of the disease. Um, and it's one of the things that drives uh, all of this organ damage that we see. So you then have to say, as a, as a risk that's under one in a million versus a really significant risk of A, getting COVID, particularly if you're in a risk group, and B, um, having complications from clots if you get COVID. Which way does the, do the scales go? And the scales clearly tip massively in favor of having the vaccine if we do decide that this, there is a link. Yeah, so given that, how long should this pause on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine last, especially since we are going to be getting millions of doses? Well, we're at the moment in discussion with the Food and Drug Administration in the United States and with the World Health Organization. They're obviously looking at these six cases because, as I say, when you have an unusual event, you can't just jump to the conclusion, aha, this is because of the vaccine. What you have to have is a proper analysis of who was the person who was affected. Did they have any other risk factors? In this case, for clotting something like smoking or the oral contraceptive pill. What was their profile? Were there other things that might have explained why this could have happened. So all of that is currently going on in the United States with the Food and Drug Administration, and we're in constant linkage with them. But this is six cases. So we're hoping that it's going to take a couple of days uh, to get that answer, and then we will then uh, evaluate. So the study is not stopped. I want to under underscore that. The, the study that is being introduced in the J&J vaccine for healthcare workers is paused while we wait for this feedback. Yeah. And lastly, in terms of the other vaccines out there, does the regulatory body in South Africa work with other bodies across the world to now try to find these issues with those other vaccines before we actually introduce it in South Africa? I guess we have some sort of advantage here, right? Because there are other countries using those vaccines in the millions already. So should we assess that thoroughly before people in South Africa are vaccinated, in particular with the Pfizer vaccine, which we'll also be getting? So I think you have to balance uh, the absolutely urgent need to introduce vaccines with uh, saying, well, how much data do we need before we think it's safe and what is safe? Um, so, so you have to balance those things. And at the moment, there's a huge, urgent, ongoing need to introduce vaccines. And I think most scientists in this country are all at one with this, and as is the, the health minister. That is the priority. Uh, and why? Because we know that most of the vaccines that we're looking at, all the vaccines we're looking at, protect against severe disease, even in the face of our variant in South Africa. And that's what we want to do. We want to lower the death rate from COVID. We want to protect people over 60, people with other coexisting conditions that increases their risk really significantly of becoming severely ill or dying from COVID. So, so we really are, 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 are keen and pushing towards doing that. But what we are doing as a regulatory authority and worldwide, and this hasn't just started with COVID, this is a, there's a science of monitoring the safety of vaccines, which is extremely sophisticated and well developed. So we have defined what it means to monitor safety and huge groups of people, best brains in the world have got together and all of those definitions have been developed over years. But we also have, we are also using apps and electronic networks that are global to pool all of the data that we find around the world. And the WHO has specialist sites that continuously look at any safety signal and will interrogate it. And there's a specialist global committee that does this. So um, this is a global setup to monitor safety precisely because 
some of these rare events are exactly what they say they are. They're rare. So we might only see one here or one there and one in another country. Then you have to pull them all together and say, are we seeing a signal or is this just chance? And that's what we're doing at the moment. And SAPR is very much part of that process. Is what's happening a consequence of the vaccine process being rushed across the globe? No, it's not. Uh, although the vaccine process was accelerated, it, uh, I think accelerated is the right word rather than rushed. Uh, we have known since, if I go back in my experience to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, we realized then that if we have other outbreaks that spread globally, which is what we're seeing now, that we need to be much better prepared to rapidly develop vaccines. So all sorts of efforts have gone on for many years to sort of increase our preparation. We've invested in what we call vaccine platforms, which are, are the sort of the basis of a, a vaccine that can be rapidly changed for a new pathogen that, like this one we hadn't previously experienced. We've invested in, in new vaccines for uh, diseases that we thought could cause a major outbreak. Um, and some of those vaccines have now been able to be rapidly switched to look at, at COVID-19. So, so we've done a whole lot of, of preparation there. So when last year, when this started, we were able to press a go button because a lot of global work had been done, scientific work had been done behind the scenes leading up to this pandemic, precisely because we feared a pandemic and we knew we would need to get vaccines quickly. So we've, we've had vaccine candidates, we've had platforms, but we've also been able to look at manufacturing very rapidly. And we've also been able to look to have global groups of people looking at the science behind rapid development. What do you need to do in the laboratory in terms of tests? Which animal models do we need to use for this new virus? Because animal models change for, new, for different pathogens. And then how do we accelerate that clinical trial process? Not rush, not yeah. miss things out, but how do we say instead of having a phase one, a gap which could be a year, 18 months, and then phase two, and then gaps, how do we go phase one, phase two, phase three? And that's what we've seen has been done, that there's been an acceleration of that clinical trial process. Yeah. For any vaccine, you need to roll it out and look very carefully for these sorts of very rare events that you're just not going to see, even if you have a large clinical trial at the end of 40,000 people. You're not necessarily going to see it there, and you must monitor when you roll out any new vaccine. Yeah, and of course, the accelerated approach is something that was needed given what the virus was doing across the world. Very lastly, my question to you is, South Africans who were hesitant even to begin with when it comes to taking this vaccine, this has now raised alarm bells for all of those people who were hesitant. What do you say to them to reassure them? Well, I think that uh, there, are few, there are a few people in, in every society in the world who are just don't want to take vaccines full stop. So, and I don't think anything we can say will, will change their mind. But there are many people who are asking the same, same sort of question you just asked. It's like, have we gone too fast? How do we know it's safe, et cetera? So what I would say there is, number one, the systems to monitor safety have clearly worked. And this is why we're pausing. We paused with AstraZeneca. We are doing these stop starts that are confusing. But it's because we're being very, very careful about safety. That's, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, that you as an individual have to weigh up for yourself. What is your risk? If you're over 60, if you have diabetes or high blood pressure, if you're overweight, um, your risk of getting COVID and getting severe disease is really very significant. And that's where we're seeing the hospitalizations and the deaths. And there have been excess deaths in this country because of COVID. Make no mistake about that. So you have to think for yourself, uh, am I going to take a less than one in a million chance if we think there's an association? Or am I going to risk getting COVID with my profile where I might end up becoming really sick? And just remember as well, even for younger people, we're now seeing that COVID, even if you don't get severely ill and hospitalized, or, you know, et cetera, we're seeing this horrible phenomenon of long COVID which is affecting young people as well. And it can affect people even with mild to moderate disease where the symptoms continue and can affect all sorts of different organs of the body, the heart, the lungs, and anyone of any else to get. So you must weigh up for yourself, for yourself the benefit versus risk. And I can tell you in the health sector, 
everyone is saying, I want the vaccine. I'm not hearing anyone saying, I'm too frightened to have the vaccine. In fact, my friends, I know I'm a different age group, but we're all saying, <laughs> when are you going to get the vaccine for us? Oh, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time, Professor Helen Rees, Chairperson of the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority.